Any, any questions on this? This is kind of the important um, part. Now, a few things you need to not forget. Okay? First of all, we are still working with linear systems. Okay? So what you have over here is a linear system and this only works if it's a linear system. So why am I emphasizing this? If you have an airplane, how do I get a linear system? I first get the nonlinear systems, I find the equilibrium point, I still linearize it around the equilibrium point and that's that. Okay? So this really is only valid around the equilibrium point, right? around the point that you linearize. It's not valid everywhere, which means if I find a K-matrix over here, it doesn't mean that the airplane will be stable everywhere, or I move the eigenvalues anywhere I want, everywhere, and it's valid throughout the whole flight envelope. That's not true. It's actually only valid around the equilibrium point around which you linearize it, so never forget that. Sometimes people lose that perspective. This is only valid around that equilibrium point. So therefore this is only valid around that equilibrium point, so is this and so is that. Okay? That's fact number one, so never forget that. Okay? And because this is a linear system, there is no limit to you to this u, you can have u as much as you want, and x can go to very large numbers, because the, 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 the real physics is kind of lost, right? It's, it's just linear. I mean, think of it like, I mean, this is always a great example, the CL alpha curve, right? The CL alpha curve is something like this, for the most part. And then you stall and you get something like that, all right? So if you would linearize this CL alpha curve, say, at this point, you would find a linear line that looks like that. And it, this would go basically to infinity because it's a linear, if, it, if it was a linearized system. But in reality, the nonlinear system actually curves and go this, goes this way because it stalls, right? Wings stall. But the linear system would never know this and it would go like this. Basically, if it was a linear line like this, if it would be a linear system like this, you could give alpha equals 100 and you would actually find a CL for it. Right? Which is obviously not physical and it's not true. Because in, we know this is going to curve and, and this is probably only going to be valid say to approximately, I don't know, 15 degrees. After that it will probably stall. Right? Good. So. So if I would lose, sometimes we use this line. Remember, we sometimes sell CL is equal to times CL alpha times alpha, which means this is really a number. Let's call this A. It's A times alpha. So it's basically a linear curve, right? If it's a symmetric airfoil. If not, you add a little B over here, and then it's A alpha plus B. It's a linear, it's a, it's a line. So you give alpha, you give alpha anything, you get CL. So this line goes to infinity. And we sometimes say, oh, this is only valid when the uh, wing has not stalled. This is only valid if, if the airplane did not stall. If it stalls, this is not valid. What do we mean, really? What we mean here is that we said we made a linear approximation which is only valid before the stall, right? After the stall, this is not valid anymore. So, same thing applies over here. You need to understand where this is valid for your airplane. Because when this is valid, this is valid, and this is valid. If this is not valid anymore, so is not more, this one will not be valid anymore, this K, and therefore this will not be valid anymore. So you always have to make that understanding and that's why aerospace engineers need to take a grip on this and fully understand that to make these kind of judgments. Okay? Maybe at the beginning of the class I, I tried to tell you that control theory, I mean this theory, uh, can be explained from many different perspectives. But 
oftentimes these control systems are designed by aerospace engineers because these kind of judgments have to be made. And in order to do that, you really have to understand flight dynamics and aerodynamics to say this is valid here, this is valid that, maybe we should ignore this, maybe we should add this, maybe, you know, all these kind of judgments. So, so this is, anyway, this is our business. So we're trying to find these K matrices that make sense. But never you lose the fact that we are in the world of linear systems and this is nothing but a linearization of a point of the nonlinear aircraft. Fortunately, wings and airplanes, they are quite linear, but there are lots of aerospace applications where things are not linear, okay? So what do you do if the airplane is changing its behavior as it goes faster? Let's say you have an airplane. Let's give an example of a helicopter. That's a better example because the helicopter, this system, the linearization of the system or this, this linear system is changing a lot on a helicopter from hover, you know, when it's in hover, in low speed, when it's going faster in forward flight and when it's going really fast. So you, you, you will see an, an airplane, a helicopter would change its characteristic quite a lot while it's going forward from hover to forward flight. Okay, so this will change a lot. So what do you do with a controller? Because this is changing from flight condition to flight condition, you would start redesigning this K value. So in other words, Let's say you have a helicopter that's in hover, okay. Let's say you have another helicopter that's flying forward, um, forward flight, uh, let's say around 30 to 70 knots forward flight. And then you have the high speed forward flight Okay, and let's say this is higher than uh, more than 70 knots. So we are talking 100, 100 knots, 120 knots, and so on and so forth, right? Two different conditions. So all these three flight conditions will have, if you linearize it around these points, will have its own dynamics. Okay, this would be dynamics one. And let's call this dynamics two. Let's call this A1 X plus BU. In fact, let's call this one one, one, and let's call this one two, two, and this is flight condition two. And the third one would look like this. X dot is equal to A3 X plus B3 U. Okay? Three different flight conditions. So what would you do if you wanted to have a stable airplane, a stable helicopter for, uh, for, for all flight conditions? Well, for this one we would probably calculate a feedback matrix K1. For this one we would calculate a feedback matrix K2. And for this one we would calculate a feedback gain K3. So when the airplane or the helicopter moves from hover to 30 knots, we would be using K1. When you're moving from when you pass K3, uh, when you pass uh, 30 knots, we would move to K2. So when I move from 70 knots higher, faster than 70 knots, I would start using K3, okay? So usually I wouldn't go discreetly from K1 to K3, so I, it wouldn't be like a switch, but it would be like a hysteresis or something that would slowly take you to K, from K2 to K3, okay? This type of thing we call gain scheduling. Gain scheduling. So we schedule the gain based on the forward flight. So basically I would have a table in my little control system, in my little autopilot, that would say here's your velocity, 0 to 30 knots, and then 30 to 70 knots, and 70 knots, to 140 knots, let's just say, I'm making this up, the gain will be, the gain matrix will be K1, K2, and K3, and this is what we call gain scheduling, okay? I wrote it already. So we schedule the gain based on some flight conditions. 
Now I scheduled it only for forward flight, but you could also schedule it based on altitude, right? Because the flight characteristic will probably be quite different if you fly at sea level or you fly at 10,000 feet, right? Or you can schedule it based on temperature and altitude, so it would be a function of basically the air density. So, because as the air density is changing, so will be the linear models. So therefore, you might have a quite a complex gain scheduling system if the system is quite nonlinear. Okay. Now, imagine that this is not a helicopter but an airplane and it's not stalling and the model that you represent in low speed can be used everywhere. Imagine an air, a helicopter, let's just say. It just has a linear model that is the same everywhere. Then it's great, you don't have to schedule. Okay? When is that possible? That's only possible if the system in itself is linear. Just like before, right? If the system itself is linear and you linearize it, you still get the same curve. Then it's great. And fortunately, airplanes are kind of like that. Unless it stalls, it is actually quite linear. Therefore, designing controllers for airplane is a lot simpler than designing it for, say, quadrotors or helicopters. Because it's nonlinear and you need to represent each nonlinearity with linear models. Let's say you have a nonlinear curve like this. You need a lot of linear curves to represent this curve now. Like one curve, another curve, another line, another line, another line. You add these five lines together and you get this nonlinear behavior. But you need five different lines to represent this nonlinearity. If the, if the actual system looks, as I said, only like that, then all you need is really one line and you are done. Okay? So what you have on a helicopter right now, you have a nonlinearity. Of course, this is only a, now a two-dimensional system and a helicopter is a lot more complex. At least it's eight, eight it, at least it will be 8x8 eight eight because it will have PQR, UVW and all this the rigid body dynamics. But if it was like that, then you would need a curve for each flight condition. Okay? So what we're going to do in this class is now we're going to choose one, one uh, linear system like this, an LTI system. That will be our problem. I will tell you this is given this LTI system. Design K such that we have some nice characteristics over here. Okay, so that will be our first job. All right, so how does this work? How does this K actually work on an airplane? I mean, how does it, how does it work? I mean, it's nice to write these block diagrams, but how does it work in practice? Let me just quickly show you that. Let's say, because this is a question I get from students all the time after I do all these block diagrams. So, but how do you do it in real life? And how do you do it in real life? Well, this is how it works. Let's say, let's say you have an airplane, right? And let's say you have the elevator here at the back. And you want to have, you want to control the pitch of the, of the airplane. And you control it with this elevator. So how does it work? Well, this is, this is your elevator, this is the cross section, and you have this little piece that can go up and down. So if you can move it down, then, then you, you, you create more lift and nose will go down. If you go in the opposite direction, nose will go up, right? That's how an elevator works. All right, so how is this connected to the pilot? Well, the pilot here has a pilot control, okay? And this is literally, in the old airplanes, it was literally connected with a rope. Of course, with a metal rope, hopefully, right? So the pilot will pull on this, this will go up, this will go down, and you would just move. Right? It would be a mechanical system. Is this a closed loop system or an open loop? Open loop, right? It's, it's pure aerodynamics. There's nobody is intervening with the pilot. The pilot is directly controlling the elevator. In this case, the elevator would be our control U. Okay, the movement of the elevator. U, 
movement of elevator. Movement of elevator. Okay? It's basically, let's say it's an angle. Let's say this angle, U, is the angle, I don't know. Let's call it theta elevator. I don't know. I'm just making this up now. Or not call it theta, not to mix it with the pitch. Let's call it something like this, delta E. Okay? So that is your U, your control. Now, if you want to have a controller now, what we do is, and, and the pilot is actually is one to one with you. So it's, it's moving this, the, the, the control, and this is moving, this is moving, this is that. So <clears throat> what do we do now with a, in, in, when we want to do a controller? We do the following. We want to feed back x. So in this case, I'm just simplifying the problem. We are looking at the pitch control. We want to control the pitch theta, right? So we want to feed back x, uh, theta. Because the system will look like this. U is the input. We have an LTI system of the aircraft. The output will be theta. I'm just simplifying this equation a lot. U is equal to theta E, right? A single input, single output system. And we want to take theta, multiply it with K, and send it over here, and we will call this R. So how are we going to do this? Well, the movement of theta, we need to measure. So there will be something that measures theta. Measure theta. What device would measure the pitch angle of an airplane? Gyroscope. The gyroscopes, right? Or the gyroscope would measure the rate. If you add accelerometers, it's called an INS, an inertial navigation system, or, or an IMU, inertial measurement unit. And there are ways to calculate theta. So you have basically a little box that is measuring theta on your airplane. OK? So what do you do with this? Now we have theta. Well, now it needs to go to another box. It's a little computer now. Computer. Or it's a microchip, all right? Something that can do calculations, OK? A PIC controller, we used to call them. Or a microcontroller, something like that. Something that can compute, OK? That will just multiply theta with k, okay, and find a number. Multiply it. So, and that would be added to a little actuator over here. We call it a serial actuator. That works in series with the pilot. And it would add the pilot control. It would add this value to the pilot control. OK? So it would be, or subtract in our case, right? So in that case, this would be, the pilot would be now R. And it would, this serial actuator, it's a little thing that moves the elevator, it can move the elevator by itself, right? Here in this, this signal would be R minus K times theta. So the serial actuator would take the signal from R, okay? And take the signal from the computer and move this line in the amount of R minus K theta. So the output over here, u, would be equal to r minus k theta. Not only r, but it would be r minus k theta. So all we need to do as control engineers is to find this value. How much should it be? Should it be small? Should it be large? Should we try it out? Right? And this is a single input, single output system. It's quite simple. But you might actually have it a lot more complex. What if you have not only theta, but you also want to control phi? And then maybe only 
also psi. What if it's not only the elevator, but you also have the rudder and you have the aileron and you have serial actuators for all of them. And now the system is becoming more complex. And this k value here now is not a number anymore. In fact, if you have three controls and three states, it will be a three by three matrix. So what should be that matrix so that this airplane is still stable? Okay? So this is how the control system works on an airplane. On a helicopter too, sometimes. It's that little thing, that little trick here, you see? You move this thing, the whole serial actuator will move, but at the same time the serial actuator can move this thing by itself as well. Understand? So do you see that connection between this and this? Here is R, here is your pilot. This is your linear system. This, is, this represents the airplane, the movement of the airplane. This represents X, multiplied with K and subtracted from R. Now, how is this happening? This is happening throughout the flight, nonstop, approximately 50 times a second. 50 times a second I would measure Calculate, do this, and move the serial actuator. Go back, measure, compute, do this, move the actuator. 50 times a second. 50 times. On a helicopter, on a small helicopter, this needs to be faster. It's usually 100 times a second. I mean, I'm just giving you rough numbers here, okay? If it's a stable airplane, you can probably get away with 20 hertz. 20 times a second. If it's a fast-moving airplane or a flying object, it needs to be faster. Most quadrotors, they run at 100 hertz. Okay, 100 times, you measure, calculate, do this. Measure, calculate, do this, 100 times a second. So you have this unstable system stabilized. It is like this thing. I'm stabilizing this with my hand. It's not easy, you see? So this is what I do. I am the control system here. My eyes, these are the sensors. This one, I measure, I look at it and go like, oops. My input is this guy. I mean, I mean the, the, the angle is theta, that's the state. I want to keep it like this. My input is the movement of my hand. So it is a feedback loop. I am the feedback, right? Trying to keep this. If it was maybe a... If it was something like this, it might be easier. Well, this one, this is easier. The dynamics is a lot easier. I don't have to move a lot, right? But as the system becomes more, I'm going to use very uh, non-scientific words, very jiggly, like that, okay, then I need to look and do a lot of work, okay? then the feedback loop has to be a lot faster. Oh, it's moving. So if it's a, if it's a quad rotor that's unstable, you need, to do a, you need to do this a lot faster. If it's a stable airplane, you can do it a lot slower, no problem. But I want you to understand this, the connection between this and this, okay? Or this and this, so that we don't lose track of what we are doing. Do you understand now how this works in a real life or this one here? I will try to set up um, some experiments in the lab so you, you can at least see one or two cases where this is used in real life and how you actually tune these things and change these things. Any questions on the practical side? Yes. Mm -hmm. frequency goes low. Yeah, the frequency usually does not have much to do with the nonlinearity. It is more like where are the eigenvalues 
of the open loop system. If the eigenvalues of the open loop system are unstable and they are really over here, which means they are, they are going unstable very fast, then the loop has to be a lot faster. So it is more like where the eigenvalues are rather than if it's linear or nonlinear. It could be a linear system that is very jiggly, okay, even though it's linear. It could be a nonlinear system where you need a lot of linear models, but each linear model is slow, let's just say. Okay? The way to check this is if you have taken uh, 384, Control Systems 1, where you look at border plots. Have you heard of border plots, Nyquist plots? That's where we are teaching these things, the frequency response of the system. Okay? So, um, it's, an, it's a quite an important concept actually, where you decide on the frequencies of these things and you look at the frequency of the system. How fast does it diverge and what frequencies does it respond and things like that. So you need to look maybe on, 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 on classic control border plots and stuff like that. Basically the frequency analysis of a dynamic system like this. This is not what I'm going to do over here. At the beginning of the class I told you maybe you should, not maybe, you should take Automatic Control Systems 1, which is the class that is parallel to this one, but it looks at classic control. That's where we are looking at these um, frequency responses, okay? But it's not really the nonlinearity. It is how, it is the frequency response of the system. Any other questions? Okay, so let me then um, give you a quick example. Let's start with a really simple example. Assume example. Assume an LTI system. Assume the following LTI system. <laughs> Maybe that's better. Assume the following LTI system. So, this is how most of our problems will start in this class. Assume this linear system. Well, it's a second order system. Is it an airplane? I don't know. We don't know what it is, right? It is a linear system of a dynamic system. The input is U, states are X, and we want to design a controller. Design a full state feedback controller, say feedback controller, such that the closed loop loop eigenvalues are at Design a full state feedback on such that the closed loop eigenvalues are here. So uh, why, where, is this, where are these numbers coming from? Uh, let me just write you down here. This also corresponds, corresponds to a closed loop response with 
omega n equals 25 radians per second and damping ratio 0 0.0. In other words, if these are the eigenvalues, then lambda square plus square omega n lambda. So let me explain what this is. We want the closed loop eigenvalues it's a two dimensional system. We want the closed loop eigenvalues to be at minus 17 and plus minus 17.65, 17.65, so we want the eigenvalues to be here, okay? The closed loop, closed loop. So, what we need to do is, number one, here's what we need to do. One, what are the eigenvalues? of the open loop. Okay? Two, is the system controllable? Because if it's not controllable, we can't design a controller. And the reason I will tell you, uh, I will tell you a lot more next week how the controllability is related to this, because there's a direct connection you will see. If it's not controllable, you cannot do this, okay? So we will see this next week. What are the eigenvalues of the open loop? What is it controllable? Three, three, we need to find such that A minus BK has eigenvalues at find K such that A minus BK has eigenvalues at this. Now, um, before I go here, let me just quickly explain you this part. Not often do we get, as controlled engineers, directly the desired eigenvalues. I mean, nobody is going to tell us, sometimes they do, but very often they don't, tell us, move the eigenvalues of the system over here. This is not usually the, 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 the proposition that we get. The question 
the, the, the proposition that we are getting usually is something like this. They would say, we have a second order system, this is a second order system, and you have seen in system dynamics how second order systems behave, right? They have oscillations, they have overshoot, under, undershoots, and all this stuff, right? So, second order systems, they are usually represented by a damping ratio and a natural frequency, okay? So, here's, a, here's what we would typically get. We wouldn't get this, we would get this. What we would get is, Design the second order system, design a feedback controller such that the closed loop system has a natural frequency of 25 radians per second and the damping ratio is 0 0.707. So that would correspond, this is the desired, that would correspond to something like this if this was a second order system. And this one will have the eigenvalues here. So this is what the customer in this case, I am the customer, I'm asking you, and you are the engineers. In this case, this is what the customer wants. The customer says, design a system where this is the natural frequency in the, of the second order system, and this is the natural frequency of the second order system. So they say, okay, then you want this. Oh, you want this. Then this has eigenvalues of this. Oh, I have to move the eigenvalues of this one to this, if I do that, I know it will correspond to this. This is just an example for you, okay? At this point, I'm not asking you to do this. I'm asking you, I'm, I'm giving you this, and then I'm telling you find K. That's your problem. But just to, for you to understand, typically we would get something like this, and then we would find what the eigenvalues are that would correspond to this. And I know the eigenvalues of this is something else, and therefore I need to find the k-value that would correspond to that. Does that make sense? Okay, so what I want you to try at home, I'm going to solve this in the next class, in the next, uh, next week. But until next week, please try this. First of all, what are the eigenvalues of the open loop? Find that, okay, of this one. Look at the eigenvalues of this. And understand that they are different from this. Secondly, look at the controllability of this. Is it controllable? I'm asking for a full state feedback controller, so we have nothing to do really with the measurement. The measurement is whatever it is. I know, I'm assuming that the state measurement is available to me. That's why I say design a full state feedback controller. So we are gonna full, we are gonna feedback the full state X. So therefore there's no Y over here, okay? Find A minus BK. Find this at home, really. I mean, at the end, it's going to be, K is going to be, K is going to look like, what's going to K look like? You have one control, it's a single input, right? U is one control. So it will be plus minus. So this will be of size one. This will be the LTI. This will be the output X. X will be x1, x2, right? So if I take x1 and x2, multiply it with a k matrix, vector, scalar, whatever, what should be the size of k? Remember, this is a single input. So the size of the control is 1. The state size is 2. So there needs to be something such that if I multiply this with this, I should get a single number. What should it be? What should it look like? Is it a matrix or a vector? Row vector? Column vector? What is it? Row vector, right? It's a K1, K2. So that if I multiply K1 and K2, it will be X1 and X2. And if I multiply it, let's call this a V, it will be some V that will come out of there and then V will be added to R and U is a single, now everything is consistent. So K1, K2 must be a row vector. And I know that, how do I know? I know that from the sizes. I know X is a, is a column uh, <coughs> vector like this, a two, uh, second, uh, with two elements. Multiplied with K1, K2, I get one number and U is a single number. So it should look like this, okay? So, it's very simple now. Write A for this A minus BK.
I almost solved the problem now. A minus BK will look like minus 3, 8, 0, 0, minus B, 0, 4, times K1 and K2. Right? And you will get a 2 by 2 matrix from this. And this will be equal to A, a prime. The way we explain it over here, that will be equal to A prime. Right? So now that we are this far, let me just <laughs> finish it off. A minus BK is equal to, you can do this at home, is minus 3, 8, minus 4K1, minus 4K2. Right? And this should design K1, K2 such that the eigenvalues are equivalent to this. How do you find the eigenvalues of this matrix? Like we always do, right? We do this. Minus 3, minus lambda, 8, minus 4k1, minus 4k2, minus lambda, and find the determinant, and set equal to 0. That's how we find lambdas, right? All right, so let's do it. Minus 3 minus lambda times minus 4k2 minus lambda plus 32k1 is equal to 0. And this will be the square. And this should be equal to what? Should be equal to this. If that's true, then the eigenvalues will be the same. So 12k2 plus 32k1 is equal to 625. 3 plus 4k2 are equal to 35.4. K1 is equal to 16.5. K2 is equal to 8.09. Should be equal to that star, that equation. I understand that why that is, right? So, put K1 and K2 over here, and you have your solution. You take X, X1 and X2, multiply it with 16.5 and 8.09, add it to this, the closed loop, if, this, if the user is here, if the control, if the, if the pilot or whatever, the user is here, the pilot will see this as if the system is that. Although the real system is not like this. And the, and the closed loop system will have its eigenvalues over here. The, the user over here will think the eigenvalues of the, of the system are over here, where in reality the eigenvalues of the open loop system are somewhere totally different. Understood? Okay, now, this is a time where you need to study a little bit. Okay? Don't come to the next class without reviewing this. I think at this point you probably understood everything in your mind, or not everything, but most of it. But believe me, it will evaporate very quickly in a few days if you don't look at it again. Therefore, I will give you a homework 
so that you can review this. I'll put it on the web hopefully today so that you start working on this, okay? These are concepts that might be new to you. If you don't do it over and over again, you will forget, okay?